or in Korea, people call me Pek Dong Ho. That is my Korean name. And I've been involved with Korea, speaking Korean since 1971. So in Gwangju Sanamda, I went to study of Gwangju in 1971, and that began my love of Korea. I can say that in Korean. UBCSO, Hango Gyeoksal Lokarajin in Baker Kusumida. My name is Don Baker. I'm a professor of Korean civilization at, in the Department of Asian Studies at UBC, and I've been involved with Korea since 1971 and began studying things Korean academically in 1974. What I study is the history of Korea over the last two or three centuries. In other words, I'm looking at how Korea came to become a very modern country. I look, I'm mainly a culture as I'm looking at the changes in Korean culture, their lifestyles, their religion, uh, their values. That's what I'm really interested in, is how the Koreans have changed since, say, around 1800 or so. I began studying Asia by going to Hawaii in the 1960s to study Chinese. I had a U.S. government scholarship. I was a U.S. citizen. But I heard about a U.S. Peace Corps program in Korea. They didn't go to China. So I applied. I was accepted in 1971. Uh, the Peace Corps sent me to the city of Gwangju, which was then the fifth largest city in the country down in the southwestern corner of the Korean Peninsula. Korea was still very poor then. Not, not like Korea is today. I had to rent a room in a boarding house. I ate rice three times a day, right? That was difficult at first. I'm not used to rice for breakfast. The family I lived with did not speak English, so I had to speak Korean, but I loved it. I, and I loved it so much, I decided I was gonna study Korea for the rest of my life because I had such a good time in this city of Gwangju. And I made some good Korean friends, some of whom are still friends today, 50 years later. And that was the beginning of, of my fascination with things Korean. What happened to me in 1980 definitely changed my life, yes. Uh, I was primarily studying Korean history before the 20th century. But when I went to Gwangju in May 1980, I heard on the shortwave radio that Gwangju, the city of Gwangju, was being attacked by its own military as part of it. So I snuck into the city, the army was blocking the roads. And the things I saw, I will never, ever forget. Um, and so I came away from that convinced to do two things. Let the rest of the world know what happened to those people. Second thing is I want the world to know so not, something like that does not happen again. Several hundred people were killed in the city of Gwangju. I saw people killed. And that's, that changed your life. You never ever get over that. And if you have a conscience, you are determined to do everything you can to make sure nothing like that ever happens again. And I'm convinced now nothing like that will ever happen again in South Korea. Well, also, by, when I first started teaching Korean history, most people in North America didn't know how different Korea was from China and Japan. And so I see my job originally was getting people to realize that Korea was a separate and distinctive civilization and had been a separate and distinctive civilization for well over a millennia. Uh, now my job, I see, is to show people that Korea is not only K-pop and Hyundai and Samsung. <laughs> that there's much more to Korea than that. Um, and I want the rest of the world also to learn from the Korean example in two ways. One, how to go from poverty to prosperity, which Korea has done. And secondly, how to go from dictatorship to democracy, which Korea has done. I want people to see South Korea as a model for how other countries that have not yet developed that way can develop. Korea has an incredibly long history of independence. I mean, Koreans for most of the last 2,000 years, Koreans have governed Korea. People don't realize, for example, that the last uh, dynasty in Korea, was called the Chosun Dynasty, it lasted from 1392 to 1910. That's 518 years. And also during those t that time, Korea created the world's first armed-clad navy. They had in the 15th century what one scholar at Cambridge called the world's best astronomical observatory. So Korea had a lot of accomplishments, which people don't realize, both Contemporary Koreans and non-Koreans often don't realize how much Korea accomplished before the 20th, 20th century. Uh, 
it's amazing to me that they maintain their cultural identity and political independence for 2,000 years, even though they have two very powerful neighbors, China and Japan. So that's, that's what I want people to, uh, to understand, that there's much in Korean history to admire and to learn from.